Hi everybody, I'm Brent Stafford and welcome to day five, the final day of RegWatch special coverage of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, Good Cop, Bad Cop, the counter conference to COP10, the World Health Organization's conference of the parties to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which was happening this week in Panama City, Panama. And joining us again today, live from Panama, is David Williams and Martin Cullop from the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. Gentlemen, great to see you. Good to see you again, Brent. And you're right, day five. We made it. We made it through the week. We made it to Friday. Yeah, great to be here, Brent. And nobody got arrested? Not that we know of. Not that we know of, but I'm sure we'll hear about that if it happens. But there's a there's an expert party tonight, so who knows? We may still t may still have time. <laughs> so why don't we just start right off the bat for those that may have missed what's been going on this week. Give us a kind of a wrap, Martin. Um, well, we've, we've been we've been updating people on our YouTube and to people who are here. Consumers have been here watching uh, what what we're f trying to find out what you know, what we've, what's been going on at COP. Uh, we've been scrutinizing the journals and the bulletins to sort of get an idea of what's happening behind the closed doors. And there's been little hints here and there. So we can we can sort of give an idea of, of what's going on, um, which things have passed with, with consensus, which ones haven't, which ones they're still arguing about right now. Um, so, yeah, we, we've, we've, I think we've educated a few people. I think a few people watching will have got a better take and better grasp on what these events are all about. Yeah, and, and Martin, you know, why don't we talk about how, you know, they're behind schedule. You know, listen, our conference went without a hitch, <laughs> right on schedule, but there were some concerns, right, with how the schedule went with uh, the WHO and their meetings. Yeah, I mean, they've they've really struggled. Uh, they've been talking about Articles 9 and 10, which is to do with contents and emissions. Um, they've been struggling with that for three, nearly four days now, and um, and they've as far as I know, they might still be discussing it. They've got two times set out for the closing plenary tomorrow, which is where they will just close the whole meeting down and, and say it's ended. Uh, tell us what what decisions are made and which ones haven't, which ones we might will be passed on to COP11. And of course, tell us where the next COP meeting will be held. Uh, but that could be 10 o'clock in the morning till 1, 1 p.m. or they've got a reserve slot for it for 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. So I don't know what we don't know, obviously, because it's, it's behind closed doors. What's what's the progress? But it could well be looking at the journals and how much they still have to get through or they've still had to get through this morning when they uh, today um, that they might have to sort of use some of tomorrow as well to, to finalize things. So if I hear you correctly, just just to make sure the portions of the conference in which they're discussing the restrictions on vaping, that's where they're held up. Yeah, they've, they've got three issues. They've got Article 13, which is on tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship. They were still due to be discussing that today. Uh, they still had Article 9 and 10, and we're hearing rumors that that um, Article 1D, a proposal on Article 1D, which is to do with harm reduction, has been rolled into that, and that there's a, a draft decision being posted by St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, uh, and if that's the case, then then it's kind of counter to one of the WHO reports. There's a WHO report, uh, uh, SCTC COP 10 slash seven, which was um, a report trying to roll um, uh, safer nicotine products into the premises of the, the article nine and 10 on contents of emissions. So now the other, the other option is to then say, well, if you're rolling those things in, you need to consider harm reduction at the same time. It's a bit complicated, but that seems to be the sticking point of, of what they're doing with Articles 9 and 10. Um, and it also goes down to the fact that they surveyed the parties in 2020 and 2021, uh, and they didn't want an expert group, which is picked, cherry picked by the WHO. They wanted a working group. And so this, this is all in broad. It must be a really complicated situation going on. So I can, I can understand why they're taking so long with it. But there is the other thing, uh, the agenda item on novel and emerging products. And they were still discussing that and they were, they were still having to discuss that today as well. So that's where we hope the voices are standing up for harm reduction in the in the discussions on novel emerging products and also if there has been a draft decision submitted uh, on articles 9 and 10 which includes uh, taking into account article 1d on harm reduction that's where we also hope that our our uh, you know the parties who who liberally 
uh, regulate vaping products and other less harmful products. That's where we hope they're standing up and making their voices heard as well. Yeah, and ain't bureaucracy grand? I mean, they are so muddled in these conversations now, which is good, right? Because we were concerned this was just going to be a rubber stamp uh, for what the WHO wanted. And what I find fascinating, and you know, forgive me if I find a little bit of hope this week, but mm -hmm. have a country like St. Kitts and Nevis and Guatemala, and obviously Brazil had their issues, but you have a, a country like St. Kitts and Nevis that really was a, a common sense sort of statement that of what they wanted out of this and really has mucked everything up for the World Health Organization. Imagine bigger countries doing this and speaking the same language that St. Kitts and Nevis is speaking. And that's why I hate to say it, but I am encouraged that you know, two years from now or a year and a half from now, whenever they have the next COP, is that we have other countries that go, wait a second, this small entity, this small country spoke up and, you know, we want to do the same. And I really hope it gives other countries the courage to, to really look at uh, look at the WHO. So again, this could be a very positive uh, development. Well, there is the old saying when it comes to government or quasi-governmental bodies like this is that no movement is good. Like anything that kind of gums up the wheels or slows things down is a benefit almost always to the, to the citizens and taxpayers in which that they're governing. Yeah, for sure. And especially the taxpayers, uh, because as I mentioned before, the U.S. sends $400 million to the World, World Health Organization. I know I sound like a broken record, Brent, but that's a number that sticks in my brain and really makes me mad, considering that they closed down these meetings and listen, the U.S. is not a party to the treaty, but they still send money to the World Health Organization. And that's the umbrella organization here. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of my money that's going to an unaccountable bureaucracy. And isn't it, I mean, from the American point of view, no taxation without representation. And this is taxation, money is going to them, and there is no actual true representation. Oh, be still my beating heart. You are saying the words that I love to hear, mm -hmm. and no taxation without representation. And that's simple, right? And it's, it's an American ideal, but it should be an ideal for every country. And especially when you look at these unelected bureaucrats at the United Nations, at the World Health Organization, European Union, you name it, there's a lot of places that have taxation without representation. Martin, let me ask you, I mean, you know, not to get it sounding hopeful either, because I've been covering this for so long now, but I do get a sense that maybe things all have gotten gummed up here a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, the, they were trying to throw all their eggs into the into one basket on this. You could tell from the reports they were putting out to the parties that they would they would try they were going hell for leather to try and get things crushed. I think I think it's only a hunch. I just get the idea they've been thinking this is the last chance saloon. Um, the genie's out the bottle on these products and, and more and more countries now are thinking, look, we can't hold back the tide. We might as well just regulate them. And we've seen countries in, in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and in, in Latin America and another country across Europe starting to think, well, we may as well regulate and tax them rather than try and uh, ban them because we're just going to get a black market. You know, there are too many users, and um, when you when you when there's demand for a product, a heavy demand for it, and you ban it, the inevitable result is you get black markets. So I think they would try and to throw everything. It didn't help them having having the postponement. I think that doesn't help because it, it destabilizes many of the delegations. I mean, from footage we've seen from the statements, you see lots of empty seats in the convention center. So, you know, how do you get consensus when some some delegations might be short of members? So, yeah, I think it's, it's there's a lot of discussion. There were things that we thought would go through quicker and they haven't. So I don't know, it, often with these things, it, it, it promises so much and then really it doesn't, there's not much comes out of it, just like the climate change cops, you know, they, they make big statements of what their intents are. And then, you know, it gets churned through and you just get a few weak declarations at the end of it. So hopefully the, the worst of the excesses are, are going to be held off. Uh, we, we hope that anyway. But I, I'd just like to say that, you know, as David said, St. Kitts and Nevis, they're the star. There's always a star at these COP, COP conference. Uh, um, in it, COP9, it was the Philippines who, who came up with a blistering statement, which we all saw on YouTube. 
uh, and this this year it's a it's a nevis like say um, Guatemala but there are other Armenia had a, had a good thing El Salvador was was quite positive uh, New Zealand mentioned harm reduction uh, I've said before I was completely disappointed that the UK's one was very cowardly didn't even mention the swap to stop campaign but um, but there was there was plenty of people uh, uh, this uh, this thing talking about harm reduction and and having the view that maybe banning and heavily regulating isn't the way to go that's good news. Um, Martin, um, yesterday you mentioned a couple of times, and obviously over the course of, of all of the coverage that we've done over the years in interviews with you in the past, you've brought up this kind of dehumanizing of uh, the smoker and the vapor. And it got me to thinking about the very concept of tobacco control, because human beings came up with that term and, and that they're so proud of. and. To me, isn't part of the dehumanizing very much in the very words tobacco control? Because the only other thing that you would do is like pest control. Like <laughs> it really is like, you know, poison control, pest control, tobacco control. What other things are out there that could be framed that way? Well, yeah, we, we discussed this one of, one of the panels earlier. Um, we had a consumer panel and we we're talking about how how the WHO and, and public health tobacco control tend to talk about smokers and, and vapors and talk about the products they use rather than talking to them. They don't want to talk to them. And there is this this kind of attitude that anyone who's weak enough to smoke or, or needs to use nicotine is somehow, um, you know, a, some an underclass or, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, de dehumanizing thing. They just don't consider them even human beings, if, 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 if you could say it that way. And we had a, a, an example of that with a, a tweet against Joe Maguero yesterday uh, from someone in Kenya who, who found it perfectly acceptable to send a tweet which kind of implied that she was wishing cancer on him purely because he was advocating on behalf of uh, uh, vapors and, and, and um, vaping products. So there is that superior superiority complex that you see regularly these things and it's really rather unseemly um and they I, I said on the panel you know would they say these things to someone's face they probably wouldn't would they say it to their family who you might use these products they probably won't but they they seem perfectly acceptable to just throw these insults out at people who smoke and people who vape on social media and elsewhere yeah and and, and brent real quickly i would say that addiction is probably the most human thing to go through right but also redemption is to go from addiction to kicking the habit, whether it's drugs, whether it's smoking, drinking, you name it. You know, the redemption is also the human aspect of this. And that's what I find disappointing by the World Health Organization. They're not giving people that road to redemption, that road to getting rid of that addiction with these products. And we're not saying that these products should be in every store, everywhere. What we're saying is simple access to them and telling the truth about these products, telling the truth about the science. And we had scientists here talking about the truth about the science. So addiction is human and redemption is human. We all love a good redemption story. Well, you just uh, teed up the cl next clip then for us. It is again with uh, Dr. Jazjeet Alawalia, who is a physician, public health scientist, professor of behavioral and social sciences and internal medicine at the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies at Brown University School of Public Health. So, I mean, he's a big dog. So that's, have a listen. Isn't there some room somewhere for redemption? Is the idea here that the tobacco companies are not allowed to redeem themselves? It's a very interesting question. I actually asked my students at Brown University in my tobacco class about that. And um, I don't know where the discussion went. And a student sort of got back to me and said that they felt like redemption wasn't the right word. And I actually agreed with them. I don't remember what the right word would be. But I think what the, the concept, what you're saying, redemption, I, I know what you're saying. And I think that is a very good question that we should all look. We, the United States, for example, for people who have been incarcerated, when you apply to college in generally the United States, there's a box that says, have you been incarcerated before? 
I don't know if it's on the universal application or in the supplementary applications, as that works in the US, for colleges. There's a big movement at the elite colleges like Brown and Harvard and so on and so forth. That box has been removed, the idea of redemption. In other words, you've paid your dues, you went to prison, and you're out now. I think that all religions, Christ and Christianity, Sikhism, Islam, Judaism, etc., feels that um, we all can be redeemed, we all make errors, we're all human, and um, if you can learn from them and grow from them. And likewise, one would think the industry can, this is my opinion, um, I think they should be still watched very caution, cautionary, because anything that is a for-profit company, which I support, uh, for-profit companies, I support for-profit and generally, um, uh, should be watched with caution, because there's a profit motive. And the government should be watched with caution too, because governments profit greatly from tobacco, either through tobacco taxes, you know, or India as investment in ITC, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one should watch all things with a cautionary eye. And I think, but on the other hand, corporations also are the biggest innovators. They create innovation. Like for example, you know, people don't trust Exxon, Seneca, Ar 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 Aramco, Aramco, the, the gas station, oil producers. But they're the ones who also are going to very quickly start innovating into solar and wind and things like that. And people, you know, the worst industry is the tobacco industry for people, right? In general, at least in the US. Next down is probably the uh, nuclear industry, uh, the war machine, the defense manufacturers, you know, Northrop Grumman and all those people. And right up there is also the uh, oil industry, very high up. And ironically, you know, they may profit, they toxify the environment and so on and so forth, but they will also be the innovators that are going to help come up with a solution. It's not going to be me, you know, it's going to be the innovators and the money that backs it, that does it. So it's a long-winded answer to, you know, I think we, we have to watch things carefully, but we should support innovation and we should just support harm reduction. By the way, gas is hard. I drive a, I drive a combustible car. And many people don't understand this. When you buy a fully electric car, it's made with uh, lithium. And it turns out that the carbon emissions, I'm not an expert on this, to create, I read this in Consumer Reports, that you have to keep your electric car for five to seven years for it to have been net neutral on carbon emissions compared to combustible. And that electric car has to be your primary car. I just think that it's so um, excellent to have somebody in a position like that, um, a physician, a, a professor, a researcher, talk highly and you know very intelligently about the conundrum around business and the uh, and the pitchforks and torches that are carried by so many. I, and David, I can't help but think this, but is there something uniquely different about Americans that make them? suffer from these kind of moral panics or these, you know, bouts of righteousness? Maybe it goes back to our puritanical days. Maybe it goes back to the Puritans that, you know, we have this. And I was struck by his, his interview and his comments because he talked about companies innovating. And Brent, I, I have an iPhone right here. Mm -hmm. The government could never create an iPhone. You know, this was a company that created this technology. So why aren't we relying on companies to create the new technology for harm reduction? And, what, and whatever that harm reduction is, right? I mean, across the board, but especially when it comes to smoking and uh, tobacco harm reduction. So I love to hear that. I love to hear that you know, innovation will bring us to the next step. And the World Health Organization is not talking about innovation. They are talking about the exact opposite of innovation, quite frankly. So it's a, it's a breath of fresh air to hear that. And let me just uh, bring up uh, a story that came across uh, the wire today. This is the National Post in Canada. So it's Canada's, you know, it's the Post Media. So this is the big time uh, newspaper. And first reading in British Columbia, the province that I live in, it takes a break from handing out free opioids to crack down on nicotine pouches. The idea of keeping the public safe by limiting their access to addictive substances is noticeably at odds with how the province approaches illicit drugs. Basically, British Columbia is ground zero for 
fentanyl and, and heroin, like for decades, you know, the heroin problem. We are also the only region in North, well, the first region in North America to come up with safe injection sites. And Dr. Mark Tyndall, who's been on our show numerous times as a huge supporter of tobacco harm reduction, um, it, it was responsible for bringing in and really pushing through um, the safe injection sites and needle exchange and all that stuff in Vancouver. In the last couple of years, the British Columbia government has started handing out free um, opioid replacements, but opioids, uh, to drug users, which the National Post has tracked uh, very closely, is being diverted into the black market and then sold to teenagers and so forth. So while all of this is going on, the British Columbia government is cracking down on safer nicotine pouches. Boy, Martin, where do you start with that? I mean, that's just, you know, incredible to hear that this is happening anywhere, especially in Canada. It's just another moral panic, isn't it? I mean, but what they think people have been doing for years when they're smoking, they've been taking nicotine. It's not the nicotine that's been killing them. It's the it's the smoke and the tar that's been killing them. So why do they think this is all of a sudden so? I mean, there's no there's no evidence of any harm from it. They haven't even really started doing much uh, research into it. They're talking about banning something or cracking down on it before there's any research even been done on it. I mean, what, what a silly thing to do. I know. Uh, and well, and, and they, they don't, sorry, they go don't, ahead. Because you look at the 1970s when you had nicotine gum that was approved. You have nicotine pouches, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, the science said, yes, nicotine is safe. This it, It's fine. So for them to backtrack on the science from 50 years ago is, mm -hmm. is quite odd, quite frankly. Yeah. And as we said the other day, uh, nicotine is listed on the, by the WHO as an essential medicine. So why the panic? It's just it's just it's just irrational and really rather um, unintelligent moral panicking. Well, raising safe and healthy kids is our most important job. It is also a tough job, says the Premier of British Columbia. It's all about saving the kids. And it's not the government's job to save the kids. It's the parents' jobs to save the kids. And also, if they want to save the kids, and we have the campaign Tobacco for Free Kids, if they wanted to help kids, they would make these products available to their parents to the parents that are sitting at home in the easy chair, watching sports, smoking one cigarette after another. They don't have the energy to get up, to kick a soccer ball, throw a football, play baseball, whatever the sport is, they don't have the energy to do that. So if they really care about the kids, they would make these products available. And we've talked about my personal story with my father, and I'm sure people that are watching have a story about their parent their parents smoking and maybe they're a parent now and they want to have a better future for their kids so they can play with their kids so again i get really angry when i hear about the government talking about kids because the government is not our mother and father they think they are but they are not and they should get out of the way especially of tobacco harm reduction when it comes to tobacco harm reduction yeah, I'm going to tread on uh, on treacherous ground here, but you know there's other issues going on in healthcare where they seem to not really care so much about the kids by allowing and encouraging them to chop off body parts and so forth for some ideology. You can't on one side say we're trying to protect the kids and on the other foster that um, kind of behavior. Yeah, I mean in the UK, uh, nicotine gums and patches are available to be given to kids from 12 years old without their parents' permission. And there's been numerous stories over the years in, in tabloid about some, some kid, 12 year old, 13 year old, um, you know, taking the chewing gums and instead of just having one, having about five of them because they're quite tasty and then uh, overdosing on nicotine. But they don't seem to have a problem with that. Um, it's just a, a moral panic. It's, it's a bit of snobbery as well. I think it's, it's because, because a lot of uh, nicotine intake or a lot of smoking happens in lower socioeconomic groups. So I just think they just sort of look down their noses. Um, it's just, I, don't, I don't understand it. It's just snobbery. It's, it's probably ignorance as well, a lot of ignorance and, and you know, not even thinking about things before you think, let's, let's grab for the ban hammer straight away. What about this? And let me throw it at both of you, kind of tying in the dehumanization aspect um, and so forth. And, you know, all the new laws that seem to be popping up to try to, you know, ban the, you know, the use of 
smoking, right? Like as a certain age, so age gated or whatever. So the UK has brought, brought up that they might do that. I'm wondering, is maybe the whole issue about the kids is that tobacco control's real plan was to breed out the adult smokers. We can't do much about it. We certainly can't stand to allow this, you know, nicotine vaping thing to, to, to flourish um, because there's no, you know, so their whole plan was to kind of let the adults die. And then, but if they keep those kids, a generation of kids as not nicotine users, that gives them the shot at actually winning the war against tobacco. I mean, that's, that's possible, but I really just see an anti-tobacco industry message coming out of the World Health Organization. They are fixated on the world, on the, the, the tobacco industry, and everything they talk about is tobacco industry this. And when it comes to um, illicit trade, the black market, you know, it, they don't work with Interpol because Interpol works with the tobacco industry. I mean, if anyone knows where the legal cigarettes are going, it's Interpol and it's the tobacco companies. The World Health Organization should be listening to the smartest people in the room. They're not listening to anybody in the room except themselves. So this is really weird fixation on the tobacco industry. And, and the crazy part is a lot of these products don't come from the tobacco industry. They come from mom and pop vape shops. They come from you know small business. So they're getting it completely wrong on so many levels. It's the tobacco industry that really lives rent free in tobacco controls head we we have a side apartment we have a closet in their uh in their minds but the tobacco industry has most of the room in their in their brains <laughs> there's no doubt um all right gentlemen so um we do i just wanted to check with you guys on the timing uh is there a particular time for dr pelosa that we need to hit for the interview i think he's uh, he's here he's here yeah, yeah. okay well why don't we do the Dr. Pelosi's interview, and then we'll bring on Maria after, and then we'll come back and then we'll have as much time as we want to finish things off. Does that sound good? Yeah. That sure. works for us. That's perfect. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to play a clip from Samrat Chowdhury, who is a vaping activist out of India to use for the chair thing here. So that gives about three minutes. Okay. Here we go. Isn't it strange though, because India is a large, one of the world's largest suppliers of nicotine. Is that not correct? That is true. So while the WHO has uh, uh, somehow shifted focus from trying to save the lives of smokers to fighting the tobacco industry, when they say tobacco industry, they just mean the big four, the BATs and the GTIs and the PMIs and you know, those, those major multinationals. They do not talk about the China uh, monopoly. They do not talk about the India monopoly, which actually are selling I mean, China, it, it sells the most cigarettes that any other company does. Those companies are somehow shielded under uh, this uh, excuse of sovereignty of the nation. So the Indian tobacco monopoly in which, uh, you know, the government owns almost like a quarter or, you know, to that extent, uh, it also controls tobacco cultivation. It is the one which distributes seeds. It, this, you know, it controls which area is cultivated. So it is, in, it is, uh, milking the crop from the time that is you know sown to the time that it's sold so it is a direct stakeholder article 5.3 is being applied to a consumer you know who's just trying not to die from smoking but these companies are shielded and and who and fctc would never say a word about it i mean in fact the indian uh, health minister was given an award well yeah like i mean india is allowed to attend cop 10 yeah, right? was sharing that cop you know he was sharing that cop. So how it doesn't uh, make sense to us that, uh, you know, if it is, uh, if, uh, if a tobacco company has state backing. Dr. Pelosa, sorry about that. Dr. Pelosa, can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay, Brad. Awesome. Well, it's with great pleasure to bring you our first guest for the last episode here of our Good Cop, Bad Cop coverage. And it's Dr. Ricardo Pelosa respiratory physician, director of the Institute of Internal and Emergency Medicine, and director of the Center of Excellence in Harm Reduction, which is COHAR, right, I believe, at the University of Catania in Italy. Dr. Pelosa, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me. So could you 
take a moment right off of the start um, and explain to our viewers briefly what the research is that you've been doing and your uh, colleagues at COAR and what the findings are. You really want me to spend uh, half an hour just uh, <laughs> analyzing the research we're doing. Okay. You can do it in two minutes. <laughs> Let me tell you what we are trying to do at the COAR at the University of Catania is very simple. We're trying to, um, to explore signs that matters to consumers. And in doing so, we are trying to highlight the what we believe are the key problems in science. For example, many of the studies conducted in vitro or in animals are not replicable. You know, you can see a fantastic study coming out from one of the most illustrious organizations in the US just to re just to realize that that study is not replicable, meaning has no value. And this is not a problem just for uh, tobacco uh, for tobacco uh, scientific in the tobacco scientific area. It's 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 a common problem in several uh, fields of science. However, we tackle this in a very serious and systematic manner. The, the way we approach this is to provide a uh, um, network of uh, academic labs all around the globe, the same equipment, the same standard operating procedures, the same consumables, the same product to be tested, the same uh, standards, and, uh, and the, most importantly, the same training. So by uh, approaching uh, science in this way, we are basically trying to confirm or to discredit um, uh, findings that, that are available already in the literature. And the bottom line is that uh, talking about cytotoxicity, for example, that we can confirm seven labs all around the globe can confirm that uh, electronic cigarettes are 80% less toxic than combustible tobacco cigarettes. Uh, also, on the cancer front, we've been doing mutagenesis studies. We've been looking into very complex uh, in vitro systems to, to uh, make sure that uh, components in the aerosol of uh, E vaping products are causing or not causing uh, uh, changes that they are compatible with cancer. And we found that, that there were none, zero. So um, we, we do a lot of other research. For example, our focus now is on absolute risk. I think in 20 years time, cigarettes will be completely tobacco cigarettes will be completely phased out in uh, westernized in the westernized world so we really need to pay attention to what uh, it is called absolute risk um, this attention actually is being instilled in my mind by patients they've been asking to me uh, uh, professor Pelosa, but what is the risk that uh, that is associated by using electronic cigarette? And clearly, we as scientists, we as doctors, we need to provide that answer. So I think we are trying to shift the focus from relative risk to absolute risk nowadays. And one of our major uh, flagship projects is called Veritas. It's an investigation of respiratory health effects in vapors who never smoked in their life. So let me ask you, um, knowing all that, when you, when you, has anybody at the WHO asked you to present your science to them? Or are you welcome at COP10, um, you know, to help present this information uh, to delegations? Or are you shut out? Um, no, not really. I don't think they like what we uh, what we publish uh, in in general. It's uh, uh, counterintuitive to their narrative. <laughs> so, if you don't like a narrative, you don't invite the guest to, to talk about this. I, I I think the same problem applies to many other independent researchers that have not been invited to COP or by WHO. Uh, Do you think that they're aware of your research? 
Oh yes, they are. They are, and they try to um, to <laughs> to discredit it. So I, I'm glad. Uh, it means that um, that means uh, quite a lot to us. It means that, that we are dangerous. Dangerous. So um, help us understand how they're trying to discredit it. What do you mean? Well, in what ways? Um, they just uh, um, they just mention. Um, conflict of interest with the uh, founders like the foundation uh, smoke free world that has been one of our, our major uh, founders in in this uh, endeavor but uh, let me tell you we also receive uh, funding from pharma from uh, governmental agencies uh, this is a tribute to the good quality work we do and we are very proud of what we are doing and we will keep doing what we feel it's uh, it's uh, it's it's necessary to to be done in order to safeguard the the health of consumers, patients alike. Um, I think I feel uh, more free than anybody else in the world. I feel very privileged that I'm leading this uh, this group at the University of Catania because what we uh, create what we design the science we we envisage is uh, science that we we create our own we think this is the problem we want to solve and we go full throttle trying to address these um, research questions nobody else can have a control on what we're doing uh, I, I feel sorry for my American friends that they are <laughs> they are basically under the Damocles paid of funding from NIH. If NIH just uh, says that the science that they need to fund is um, needs to highlight risks, you know, you will propose a project proposal investigating risks. But the problem is, uh, what about the risk benefit ratio of a product? Uh, think about aspirin for a second. If I'm a doctor and I'm talking just about the adverse events and side effects of a medication, would any patient take that medication? So the point I'm trying to make is if you, um, if you create a narrative uh, uh, fixated on risk without looking at the benefit, you will never be able to achieve a risk, be a, an adequate, correct, risk benefit ratio. Right, right. Um, Dr. Pelosi, I mean, often, you know, in counter to the claims that research on tobacco harm reduction is somehow biased based on the funding coming, say, from industry or, or so forth. D am I hearing you correctly? And that is government funding can be just as biased? Aren't we all biased? ideologically or financially. I mean, the, the, I, I think the most important thing is to declare, uh, you know, your conflict and people will judge for what you're saying, what you are, that's what matters. But then cornering your science just because you are transparently declaring your conflict, that's very bad. Uh, what you're saying is also correct. And, and I mean, anybody's biased, anybody's conflicted. And I just uh, um, I put up the example of uh, American colleagues that unfortunately have to survive on grants to pay their wages. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to live in a country where my um, the state is paying for my wage, so I don't have to worry about that. And I feel very much privileged. So let me ask you, Dr. Pelosa, one last question. I'm taking a look around at what uh, the Good Cop, Bad Cop conference, and you're down there, or I'm up here, so I don't actually don't know. What's your impression on what they've done over the last week, and has it helped? That, you mean you're saying you're there, I'm here. It doesn't make a very much difference because, as you know, the COP uh, is uh, run behind the closed doors. So I, I cannot really say very much except from what is leaked through the social media. So what I can tell you 
is an I'm energized by the people that are attending this uh, this group of the taxpayer alliance group, and uh, I think they're doing a fantastic job of putting together a community. Because after all, this is all about a community. Uh, we need a community a community of people that uh, is a testament to the benefit of, uh, uh, of combustion free products and, and people we really need to know through them rather than through scientists like me or other scientists, what are the benefits that can bring into the life of smokers switching to these combustion free products. Well, Dr. Pelosa, I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today at the end of a probably I'm sure a very busy week. Um, and good luck with your research and please do keep us posted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. Maria, as you know, the FCTC holds what is called the Conference of the Parties and the COP10 Conference, which is the Conference of the Parties, is coming up next month in Panama. If you had an opportunity to send a message to the delegates there, what would it be? Oh my goodness. First of all, I'm going to Panama. Um, like I'm really happy. Like I'm so excited. I get to protest the who, not the band, but the World Health Organization. Um, so personally, my message and it's been consistent. One, who are the delegates going from Canada? I like, I mean, I get it. I don't need to know who from Health Canada is going, but I want to know is this Les Hagen guy out of out of the prairies going down there and what is he going to add to this who is going as a representative as a consumer are end users going to be part of that because let's go back to 1987 there was a document um i call it the ottawa model but it's called something else where they it's about health promotion and when we've created a a life changing device because of technology and because it's no longer 1980 something, it's, it, we're in the 2000s, we've created something. The people who use this device should be part of this conversation. I want to know who is going. Is Rob Con Cunningham going on my dime as a Canadian? Is Les going? Is Andrew Pipe going? Again, all. NGOs, all tobacco control. Where is the balance? I My expectation is that Health Canada should bring to COP what Health Canada has in Canada right now, if that makes any sense. That should be the representation, balance, um, continued conversation. That is who Health Canada should bring there. And Canada should stand up. And I've emailed Health Canada asking them, to put forth a motion to include consumers. I mean, I just, just in case someone's listening, again, I don't have a bat phone to Health Canada. I just email them like everybody else. And I just ask, this is what I would love for you to do. And joining us now in person is Maria Papayawanu. How's it going, Maria? Good, how are you? Very good, thanks. So I'm happy to see that you are not currently incarcerated in oh, handcuffs. Good. I actually went to the venue. Well, do tell. do tell. So um, it was a little crazy because there was a whole bunch of protests here where we we're staying. So I hopped in an Uber to go on a 10 minute excursion, which took three hours. Um, we finally got out of here and then we headed down to where the conference is and Sadly, it was like an empty parking lot, like a, the start of a horror movie. This large empty parking lot guarded by three military people with like those big gun things. So I asked if I could go in and they said, we need to see your credentials. And I'm like, I, I, I don't have any. I wanted to pull out my vape, but it's not really legal to have one here. So, um, and then I had Google Translate, he said no. My Uber driver, Mary Ellen, she tried to get me in. He said no to her. So finally in Google Translate, I said to him, 
I'm old enough to be your mother. Would you do this to your mother? And and he laughed and he said, yes, I would. I don't want to lose my job. So I tried to go there. I didn't go there. However, Twitter is fun. Um, we kind of have an idea of what's going on, just like any other organization. Like people share, like people from inside are not all like, oh, we hate anybody that has anything to do with uh, vaping or safer nicotine products. Um, you know, they're not all Rob Cunningham's, but Rob's there. I invited Robbie and he has a partner, Courtney, that came from Cancer Society. They're with some other funded organization. Um, he's here, Cynthia from Physicians for a Smoke-Free Canada, which, you know, I've nicknamed Cindy. I've invited her. I, I invited her out here. And um, Jeffrey, um, is it Jeffrey Tang? The professor, David um, Hammond's cohort from University of Waterloo. I took some time and I invited all of them to come out to COP10 um, because, you know, their American counterparts came. So they couldn't really use 5.3 as a reason for not showing up. And thank goodness we had photographic proof. So I sent them the picture of their colleagues coming to our hotel. Now I saw on Twitter that you posted a shot of one of the delegates shuttles. Uh, did you get on? No, oh my goodness, there's quite, there's quite a lot of security here, but a bunch of delegates, we were at a tobacco harm reduction conference for Latin America and they actually had the same hotel where a bunch of delegates were and as I pulled up, oh my goodness, there was this fancy white bus. It kind of rem reminded me of the Pan Am games, those buses that we had all around Toronto for people being shuttled back and forth. Um, no, like, you know what? You bump into some delegates here and there. Um, they can't all be that bad. So, but the messaging well, is bad, though. Yeah. That's coming out there. And let me ask you, Maria, um, how, what do you know in terms of the Panamanian government harassing some of the THR folks down there? What do you know about all of that? So I know what I've read in the paper. Um, I, I really do think is that some, there's a bit of overlap of hotels of where people are staying, um, advocates, pro THR and cop people. And I think what happened, I think at that conference, like they did hand out information and it wasn't about how to vape or what vape to buy. It was about how to stand up for your rights. And it was about promoting what we do at Rights for Vapors, like literally everything we did, we've done at Rights for Vapors, creating platforms, helping educate people is what people were going to say was illegal. And then I realized my Rights for Vapors t-shirt would be get me fined. Um, really? You would have well, been fined for for just your standard vaping t-shirt. Yeah, like I mean, in there, and I think the t-shirts they were talking about is about you know um, ownership, take ownership of yourself. You know, fight fight against these bans. Um, you know, Canada Canada's there. Like obviously, we we know that Sonia Johnson is the head of this delegation. There are a lot of people from Health Canada there. Um, policy of advisors. There's also people from other NGOs that are advising Health Canada, um, but they're not standing up for harm reduction. And I'm like so shocked because. What we do know as Canadians is that over the last, you know, especially over this last like two years is Health Canada has been inching towards harm reduction and for tobacco harm reduction and aligning, uh, aligning the principles for drug policy to align with harm, like harm reduction in that sense. And now we know there's like a standoff at COP to bring in tobacco harm reduction into the conversation instead of removing it and like i i have no idea why or maybe it's the canadian in me but like i'm just so my feelings are hurt that we're not seeing any tweets of yay canada stood up like you know there's this tiny little country called saint kitts that like is bearing the weight of every single person who smokes in this world. And that is a lot of people and that is a lot of weight to bear. And if you take a country like Canada, I'd like to take off a little bit of that pressure. I mean, we have federally, we're moving in such a great direction and to not see 
Health Canada do that on the stage, I, I it just breaks my heart. I don't know why I'm taking this personally. I mean, you take I don't, everything personally, Maria. I take everything personally. <laughs> So then final question then uh, for you, Maria, and it, I'd like to get some of your thoughts on the TPA's Good Cop, Bad Cop counter conference down there. How, you know, was, how's that been? Um, it, it has been amazing being able, I feel like Twitter came to life um, because this whole um, tobacco harm um, advocacy activism is very, very Twitter based and it, it is, around the world and it just came to life it was like just chatting and learning and so much that we have learned um from everything tpa um the taxpayer taxpayers protection alliance has done an incredible job um you know we're able to ebb and flow because things change again even though they think that no one at cop talks to anyone outside of cop like we hear what's going on i've personally heard what's going on um and like we're able to adjust our conversations i do want to say one thing though i want health i want health canada i want the cancer society because if if you can find this and add it to this is to denounce and condemn the people who put out that vape that says it's cancer flavor. Right. Um, I want the Cancer Society of Canada to step up and condemn that and put, I, 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 cancer should not be weaponized like yeah. that. And I think our Cancer Society has lost focus on what they have to do. Um, we know Robbie's gone nuts, but they do. Yes, that's it. I I want Health Canada. They were in the same room with these people. They need to be make a public statement, and I want them to denounce that this vape is disgusting. And then the way that this organization has, sorry, weaponized cancer, which is one of the deadliest diseases, is uncalled for, and there is no room in COP and the FCTC for something like this. And I want my country to stand up for that. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty crazy. Just, but they seem to get away with all of that. Well, you know, because I have a mouth and you have a platform. <laughs> well, and oh, this, TPA, this is the whole point of good cop, bad cop. That's right. Totally it is. Well, Maria, on that note, thank you so very much, and especially at the end of a long week and Friday in Panama. Smoke them if you got them. It's a vape, but I can't do it inside. That's okay. Right. Have a good one. Thanks, Maria. Do you think in some manner tobacco controls got their, you know, nose out of joint because they got a problem with capitalism? They've got a problem yes. with the market? Yes. I, I think the free market doesn't fit with their worldview. I think, yeah, I, I think they don't like to see people making money. Uh, there are certain tobacco control experts in Australia who feel that people should just quit cold turkey and none of these treatments should be used. And I think they have the ear of the government. Uh, so that would include vaping. So I think there's definitely an issue with people making money. And I think it's partly driven by the tobacco companies that have made a lot of money and have forced the issue, uh, often dishonestly. But we've got to be able to move away from that just because they've done that in the past. And yes, there's been the light uh, and the filter campaigns which were misleading and we got we got sucked in by that it doesn't mean that anything to do with making a product that makes money isn't good isn't good for public health in the past um there is a thing about authoritarian governments is they don't like to have their citizens enjoy simple pleasures yes you know if you can steal away a, a, a pleasure that's just your own yes. somehow that goes against the state yes. yes is some of that wrapped up in this I, I, I think there is it is in some people and there's a quote going around and I can't remember how exactly how it goes but the quote is that the particular person who I might mention 
secretly fears that somebody somewhere is having a good time. And, and I, think, I think one of the problems with vaping is that people enjoy it. It does create pleasure. And somehow the tobacco control gurus don't believe that they should be allowed to enjoy it. They should just stop it because it causes harm. And I think we don't bring up pleasure when we discuss the issue, but it should be allowed to be, it is part of the debate. It should be, people should be allowed to enjoy themselves, even if it involves a small measured risk that they're prepared to take. And we do that all the time in society. Well, I'm just hoping that the rest of the world wakes up to this because they're coming for your beer and wine yes. next. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Vaping today, how can they justify allowing people to do these other things that we know are harmful? With vaping, we're really not particularly concerned. We know, yeah, alcohol uh, is dangerous and some of the other things people do. Driving cars, I mean, for goodness sake, where do you stop? Where do you stop? It's a good question. David, are they coming for your beers next? They absolutely are. And we've seen the World Health Organization even talk about this is alcohol, red meat, you name it. And there's a number of reasons for this, Brent. And one of it is they don't want us to have fun, but it's also about their bureaucracy, expanding the bureaucracy because they always have to give themselves more to do, right? And that way, they can hire more people, they can have more conferences, they can spend more taxpayer money. So this is what agencies do. And we have a project in the United States where we looked at agencies, where we look at agencies, and we call it mission creep. And this is going to be mission creep by the World Health Organization, is they're gonna to start to delve into these other issues. And why can't they just leave us alone? You know, they don't believe in the person. They don't believe that we can make their, their own choices for ourselves. And guess what? We can. As a species, we've been around for a very long time, and we've made some really good choices over uh, the millennia. And I think we're going to make a lot more good choices if we don't have the WHO in our way. Now, Martin, let me just preface uh, uh, you're, you taking the cost here. Um, indeed, this isn't just conspiracy theory. I mean, all across Canada over the last uh, 12, 16 months, there's been plenty of news stories driven by WHO, but also Health Canada coming out saying that there is absolutely no safe amount of alcohol when it comes to cancer and so forth. And the WHO has a major unit that's working in this particular topic. Um, well, yeah. Um this no safe level thing is 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 nonsense and no safe level of anything really everything is harmful if you if you uh, if you take it to excess or whatever and you can you can drown in in what, six inches of water if you, if you know there's nothing safe but if they're attacking if they're attacking alcohol what they're failing what they're, what they're misleading people on is that it's well known that there's a j curve when it comes to all cause mortality with alcohol um, and it actually being teetotal is worse than than moderately using alcohol. Uh, we, we know this. This, this, is, this is over decades, and, and the, all the research comes to the same thing. And these people just deny it over and over again. They're trying to use the no safe level thing. That's what they did with, with um, uh, secondhand smoke. Uh, I mean, there's nothing really is healthy. You, you know, you go through life, and the reason your body ages is because over, over time, you know, what, what you do through life um, eventually just wears your body out. There's no safe level of anything, really. Um, it's just, it's just, it, they're just fanatics, and a lot of these people are temperance fanatics who are, who are wedded to the idea that people should, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> nothing should pass my lips, you know, except pure water or something. I don't know. Um, you, wrote, you wrote a great article uh, called "How Unelected Bureaucrats Are Using Your Taxes to Wage a Global War on Alcohol," and in that, you used a great term. You called them uh, p uh, professional puritans. Yeah, but just like in the debate with, with vaping and nicotine and tobacco, these people get paid grants. They have um, organizations uh, like the Temperance Society. They've called themselves different names now. They used to be the Temperance Society. They, they, they'll come up with, um, I, I can't remember what, what, what organizations they might have spoke to there, but these people have always been with us. You know, the people who, who organized prohibition in America, they didn't go away. They just changed the name. 
um, of what they're called. The, the, you know, and um, in that article, I was talking about the World Health, Health Organization does have a, a plan to come up with a, a global treaty along the same lines as the, the WHO's FCTC for tobacco control. They, they want it to have a, 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 a convention on alcohol control and they're actively working towards it. Uh, and 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 like David said, you know, if you put all these bureaucrats together and they're all on the same path and all get funding to do these things, um, they'll come up with all sorts of restrictions on on people's drink too. So who knows in 20 years' time, because the FCTC treaty is 20 years old. In 20 years' time, you could be having them, uh, uh, you know, having a big meeting somewhere, 190 countries talking about phasing out the end game for alcohol use or something. Yeah, and, and Brent, this is where they start, right? They start with tobacco because it's big, bad tobacco, the tobacco industry, and a lot of where it's produced is in Africa, the poor nation. So they're not going to speak up. They're not going to say anything. So this is the uh, the canary in the, in the coal mine, is that they're trying to go after tobacco and to see what they can do. And after this week, it seems like they're not accomplishing everything that they want to accomplish, but alcohol is absolutely next. They've said it. I mean, they have they have said that alcohol is next. And I would say going after alcohol, you're going to wake the sleeping giant of Italy. I can't imagine the Italian delegation and a lot of other delegations, but a lot of wine is produced in Italy and a lot of other countries. And we're talking about big countries with a lot of representation and a lot of influence in the World Health Organization, I think it would be a disaster for the World Health Organization to go after alcohol because I guarantee you probably 80 to 90 percent of the delegates are drinking right now, That's are probably out of uh, grabbing their drinks. So. Totally. Here's the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, state-run media in Canada. Uh, it's time to put cancer warning labels on alcohol, experts say. Well, here we go. I mean, we <laughs> we see this with everything that we do. And like uh, like Martin said, six inches of water, you can drown. It, it, they're trying to achieve zero risk. There is risk to everything that we do in our lives. I step outside my door in the morning. That's a risk. Everything that Martin does in his life, and I don't know what he does in his life, <laughs> but everything he does in his life, there is a risk to it. And we have to accept that. It's reducing that risk. That's why there are seat belts in cars. That's why we came up with electric vehicles to reduce the harm and reduce the risk. And that's why the industry and other folks have come up with these tobacco harm reduction products is to reduce the risk. And the study, the probably the criminal study was the Public Health uh, England said that these products are 95% less harmful. And it's a big number, 95%, but they didn't say 100% because you never reach that. You will never reach that with any product. So it's important to realize zero risk does not exist. And just yeah, one and last I'll, thing, uh, Mark, go ahead. I'd just like to say, uh, I wish these newspapers would stop saying experts say. They're not experts, call them what they are. They're activists, they're lobbyists, they're campaigners. They're not experts, they're like professional Puritans, like I wrote in that article. They're not experts. They just they just want to, they, they, they get paid for, for doing what they do. And, um, and they're, they're not experts, they're just, they're just horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> so look, the final thing on this, uh, as we move to wrap here, uh, that strikes me is that for the longest time, most of the people in my life that I know who don't smoke or never did smoke, just kind of stare at me blankly when I talk to them about uh, vaping and so forth. And they're, they're kind of, they don't understand why it's such a big topic and a big deal. And, you know, you could always make this point that you should care about it because sooner or later they're going to come for something that you love. Uh, and that's exactly it. You can't just give um, the rights, you know, I hate the word rights, but your innate individual, you know, ability to make choices about what to put in your body and to consume, those should not be just taken away lightly because eventually it will impact uh, other people uh, on other things. And Brent, I don't smoke, I don't vape, and this is one of the most important issues that my organization is tackling right now, and it has nothing to do with me, right? This has to do with 
the the people that I see around me, the my loved ones, my father that we talked about. You know, this isn't about me. And when we pursue policies, there are good policies and bad policies. The World Health Organization is spending a lot of my money on bad policy and not listening to the science. So uh, you're absolutely right. And this is, this is going to affect generations. This is not just a, a discussion we're having today. What happens this week and what happens in two years is going to affect a lot of generations after us and what they're able to do and how they're able to live their lives, quite frankly, whether it's tobacco or alcohol. Yeah, and I, I like to say people should just remember that fashions change. Um, you know, all over the world, everywhere I've been recently in the last like couple of years, and I've traveled quite a bit, everywhere you go, you sit down for breakfast and they, they offer you a cup of coffee. I don't drink coffee, I don't drink coffee or tea. And they look at you a bit weird as if why are you not drinking coffee? Um, but coffee, I don't understand why people drink coffee. I hear, hear people saying, well, oh, nicotine is a useless drug. Why do people use it? Well, if you've never smoked and you never used nicotine, then you wouldn't understand. I don't understand why people seem to say in the mornings, oh, I can't, I can't function until I've had my cup of coffee. That's completely alien to me, but I don't want to go around and stop them having their coffee. Uh, you know, they seem to enjoy it. I'll just leave them alone. Uh, you know, I've go, like I said, I, I remember when we went up to the Philippines in October and they were almost forcing coffee down my throat. They were just looking as if, what was, you know, one guy actually snuck up behind me and put a coffee on my table. Um, after I told him I don't want coffee. I mean, that's the level it got. And yet, if you go back, the battle to, uh, for acceptance of coffee went on for 300 years. Um, in, in Turkey, in, in Ottoman Empire times, if you were caught possessing, possessing coffee beans, they would sew you up in a Hessian sack and throw you in the Bosporus. You know, so, um, it, but are those places where they're forcing coffee down my throat, I just want to have a vape. My morning pickup is having a vape and having a, a dose of nicotine. Martin, how but, have you not lost your citizenship by not <laughs> drinking? That's a question that I want to know. How dare you not drink tea? Yeah, it's overrated. It's overrated. Well, all right, gentlemen, I think we've hit that point where you guys need to go off and, you know, uh, consume whatever your choice of substance is. And that is it for our final edition of Reg Watch, our special coverage from the WHO's FCTC's COP10 event. I'd like to thank the folks at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance for organizing and hosting such a great and important event in support of tobacco harm reduction. I'd also like to thank John Glauser and the folks at Demand Vape for supporting RegWatch content and to the Global Forum on Nicotine for the use of their great clips that we've shared with you over the past week. For RegWatch, I'm Brent Stafford.